So welcome everyone to today's lecture. Um, I will talk a little bit about the condition number of a matrix again because we haven't seen this for three weeks. Um, as you can remember, um, we are looking at so-called norms of vectors and matrices, meaning that we want to measure in any given mathematical space, um, environment, you could say so, um, we want to measure the distance of a mathematical object to a natural zero, whatever that is. Could be a zero function, could be a zero real number, could be uh, the zero vector uh, in a vector space, or could be uh, just the zero matrix. Um, so we generalize the idea of the norm uh, of a real number, uh, which you may well know. You might also know uh, the Euclidean norm for a vector in the R2, um, in the real plane, reellen um, Ebene yeah. in German. Um, and here um, you see even just another generalization of this idea of a norm uh, for matrices and a couple of examples. So we have the L infinity, the L1, the Frobenius, uh, and the spectral norm of a matrix. Um, and what you can do is you can measure some kind of mathematical distance from this matrix A to the natural zero of this mathematical space, which in this case is the zero matrix. These are different ways of measuring the distance, and you can simply, if, if you want to get another idea of what, why there should be different uh, norms and thus related metrics uh, in such a mathematical space, simply think of kilometers and miles. Kilometers and miles are two ways of measuring a distance between objects and between an object A and a starting point. But they should um, satisfy certain um, rules and restrictions. And this is uh, shown here, for example. So for any object A that is not the starting point, the distance to the starting point should be non-negative and should be positive. Um, if you uh, have a starting point zero and you double if you go let's say if you go if you have this starting point here and you have an object um, like the pillar there and you double the distance then the norm should also be twice the distance so it should be two kilometers for example and if you go directly from your starting point to A, the distance should always be smaller than if you were to take a deviation over B. So that's the triangular in, in equation. So these are norms. We have these for vectors, functions, matrices. Uh, we had, uh, we've already talked about compatible norms, meaning that uh, if you have a matrix norm and if you have a vector norm, they sometimes can be compatible. Um, and this would mean that this inequation applies. And then uh, we came to the application of these uh, concepts, meaning uh, we want to look at the condition number of a matrix. So we started with a um, system of linear equations, A times X equals B. We are disturbing this vector B um, by the term delta B. Then the solution will probably not be the true solution of this problem. That would be a coincidence. If you calculate with wrong input data, but get the true result, that is simply due to coincidence. And we have A times X plus delta X equals B plus delta B. So this here is the input data error. And we would not assume that we would get the true result x. But if we insert erroneous data um, and uh, wrong input data, the result should also be disturbed. So we will have delta x as well in our solution. If we write it a little bit differently, this means a times delta x equals delta b. And then we have delta x equals a inverted times delta b. And as you can see, um, the magnitude to which the final result will be changed and will be affected by an input data error is determined by 
the magnitude of the input data error, that's delta B, but it's magnified or it's decreased by A inverted, by the inverse of the matrix A. And if we write this a little bit differently, we can see that the norm of delta X divided by the norm of X, that's the relative error in your result, will always be smaller or equal to the norm of A times the norm of the inverse of A times the relative error in your input data. So you have garbage in, and the question now is how much garbage will you get out if you insert input data that, is, that includes an error. And this term here, this term governs the magnitude by which your input data error is amplified or is not amplified uh, in the solution of a system of linear equations. And this is the condition number of this matrix. So sigma equal to the norm of A times the norm of the inverse of A is the condition number of this matrix A and it gives the condition of the solution of a system of linear equations when you use the matrix A as the coefficient matrix in this SLE. So the higher the condition number is, the stronger the amplification of your input data error will be. So if you have a slight error and it will be magnified, it will be amplified by solving for the system of linear equations. And we've seen this here with this uh, very first example in the first lecture. If you were to use a Hilbert matrix um, in the solution of a system of linear equations, the same algorithm, it's the same algorithm uh, you are using here. Uh, and as you can see, A is just regular matrix, has a condition number of almost 30. Uh, if you take a three-dimensional Hilbert matrix, it has a condition number of almost 525. And the result will be that if you were to use this matrix um, in the solution of the system of linear equations, any slight error in your matrix will be amplified by a lot, almost by the factor 525 in your output vector, in your solution vector for X. Okay. Now, we can distinguish two different types of algorithms for solving for um, a system of linear equations. The first one is well known from school, from high school. That's the Gaussian algorithm or the uh, it's Gaussian elimination. Um, and this method is well known, it's quite old, it's pretty straightforward. What you do is you try to convert your matrix A into a triangular form. And you might remember this from school that if you, I don't know, if you took a um, Leistungskurs uh, in mathematics at high school, but you should probably have learned this in our math um, uh, class, that you can solve a system of linear equation or you can solve for the inverse of a matrix by bringing it into uh, a triangular form by so-called basic and elementary uh, operations mit elementar operation in dreiecks form bringen what you do is you take the matrix here uh, you write the unit matrix here and then you, operate, you perform the same operations on the left hand and the right hand side and in the end you should have something like this and the matrix here and then you have an equation for x3 then you solve for x3, you insert it in the second line and so on. That's the basic idea behind Gaussian elimination. Now a little bit more formal what you do is um, you take the matrix A you take a permutation matrix. By multiplying A with a permutation matrix, you are switching columns. And you might remember this from high school or from your math class, that if the matrix A is not yet uh, in a form that is nice for solving for this system of linear equations, you can switch columns. You can always switch, um, if you have this form here, if this is A and you have the unit matrix here, you can always switch rows, but if you were to switch columns, you need uh, to 
apply a permutation matrix. That's P. Not necessarily all the time, but sometimes it is. And then you try to find something that looks like this. A equals L times U. L is a lower triangle matrix and U is an upper triangular matrix. Untere und obere Dreiecksmatrix. And that's called an LU decomposition. In German, LR zerlegung or LU zerlegung einer matrix. You try to find such a product and you try to find two matrices, L and U, so that a given matrix A can be um, expressed and can be written as the product of a lower and an upper triangular matrix. Very simple. That's the basic math that is behind the Gaussian elimination algorithm. Again, you might have done this already in high school. And you can simply do it in MATLAB. We'll take the matrix A, 1, 4, minus 2, minus 3, 9, 8, 5, 1, minus 6. And then we just write LU of A. And this will give you the LU decomposition of A. Now we will get three results. L, U, and the sometimes necessary permutation matrix P. So we are writing L, U, and P. This is our result and we are telling MATLAB perform LU the function LU on A and then take the results and write it into L U and P and if we now access these three objects L U and P you can see that L is a lower triangular matrix U is an upper triangular matrix and P is a permutation matrix but it doesn't change anything here so it's not necessary. It can also be used to reduce the number of necessary operations. Um, and this might increase the speed of the algorithm a little bit. In high school, you might remember this if you have a matrix and you can see that um, it, it is already an almost triangular. I can give you an example. One, two, three. Um, 0, 5, no, that's not a good example. Let's take this example. You can see that this matrix is all almost in triangular form, and you only need to switch the second and the third column, and then it's a triangular matrix. So this is a very simple case where you would already see, even in high school, you need to use a permutation matrix, you need to switch columns. Yeah? So this is what the matrix P is all about. And then you can use this, uh, and you can check the um, accuracy of uh, the LU decomposition. If you have a matrix A and you have performed the function LU on A, you can simply take L and U and calculate L times u minus a and what would we expect as a result if we compute l times u minus a zero matrix if l and u are the lu decomposition of a it holds that a equals l times u and then A minus L times U should be the zero matrix. As you can see, it is almost close to the zero matrix. Still, we have a slight rounding error of 10 to the minus 15th power. So after 15 decimal places, uh, you can see you have a slight error here. But still, that's the LU decomposition. And even with the permutation matrix, it's slightly reduced, but uh, uh, in this example, there is no apparent influence. It might be after 15, 16 decimal places, but uh, in this example, I was not able to reproduce uh, such an improvement. Now, 
um, you can use the LU decomposition directly for solving for a system of linear equations. Take A times X equal to B. And remember that A can be written as L times U times X is equal to B. And then you just need to rearrange this a little bit. So what you do is you calculate L times Y equal to P times B. P times L times U. And then you calculate U, U times X equal to Y. And this will give you the result X you're looking for. Now, um, why should you use this? Um, let's try this example. First, we use Gaussian elimination. Um, B is equal to 1, 2, 3. We take the same matrix A from before. And we calculate X by A dash B slash B. And this is the MATLAB function for Gaussian elimination. And we get the result X is equal to 1.08, 0 0.19, and so on. We'll keep that in mind. Now, we solve this for this by using the LU decomposition. X is equal to U dash L dash P times B. We get the same result, at least um, with this accuracy, with four digits and four decimal points. Um, so what is the advantage of using um, LU decomposition? Um, you can see, same result. So what's the advantage of using an LU decomposition? To do this and to show this, um, I generated 100, um, I generated a random uh, matrix of dimension 100 and 100. So this is a very large matrix. And I am now taking this matrix, which remains constant throughout this program, and I solve for 1,000 random <gasps> systems of linear equations. What do I do is I say tick and talk. By writing tick and talk in MATLAB, you can um, time it. So as you can see here, elapsed time is 1.04 seconds. And I now have a for loop. I starts at 1 and goes through 1,000. B is now Every time I run this program is a random vector. I have to be more exact. It's a vector that includes random numbers. No, it's not a random vector like a stochastic random variable, but it's a, it's a vector that includes only uh, random numbers. And now I solve for x. x equals to a slash b. That's Gaussian elimination. Okay. So for 1,000 random systems of linear equation using the same coefficient matrix, which is very large, I need one second in total. Now, I know that A does not change. So I can also do the following. I compute the LU decomposition. I take LUP equal to LU of A. And instead of using Gaussian elimination, I use the LU decomposition. I time it, and as you can see, for, again, 1,000 random systems of linear equations, the elapsed time is just 0 0.09 seconds. So, in other words, Gaussian elimination is horribly slow. So, you might remember this from high school. You can do it on a sheet of paper. But uh, if you have a lot of systems of linear equations that rely on the same coefficient matrix, Gaussian elimination is the worst choice because it's relatively slow. You can just take the LU decomposition and it will be almost 100 times faster in this example. Okay. These are direct methods. Gaussian elimination, LU decomposition, um, and... 
if if only you could calculate with an infinite number of decimals it will give you the exact result so these direct methods um, will give you um, the exact uh, re um, result now in many instances you will rely on so-called iterative methods what is an iterative method uh, we've already seen this um, with the um, Newton's method uh, for finding the root of a function that is you take a starting value and you try to improve on the starting solution in every iteration until you find a solution that is sufficiently good according to some quality metric um, and here um, you can do the same thing you can try to solve for such um, a system of linear equations by applying an iterative um, algorithm why do we need iterative methods if for example the LU decomposition uh, is also a very good direct method um, in many cases in natural sciences and especially in engineering you will have to deal or you probably not you but uh, engineers will deal with huge very large matrices that only consist of zeros and maybe a couple of numbers that are not equal to zero and these matrix are called sparse matrix hmm? And they might look something like this. And so on, and maybe something like this. Almost all of the entries in these matrices are zeros. And if you were to use, you can imagine using applying Gaussian elimination. If you were to do Gaussian elimination on this matrix, what would you do? You would very stupidly calculate 0 times 0 plus 0 times 0 equal 0. Okay, next. 0 times 0 plus 0 times 0 plus 0 times 0. And you would compute an awful lot of zeros where you're in high school probably you would, you would immediately see okay I don't need to compute this to the end because it will be zero another line full of zeros okay it's zero but the computer cannot do this it will go through the matrix row by row and it will compute a lot of zeros this will use up your time and when you have such a large matrix as in engineering like 100 or 1000 times 1000 your computer will be comp will be computing zeros till the end of the day and a more sensible algorithm is needed to find the solution. There are some algorithms specifically designed to deal with sparse matrices like for example the SOR method um, and there is also Gauss-Seidel uh, algorithm but I'll discuss the Gauss-Jacobi method here. It's very simple and can be applied in some cases might not be if you have just a regular matrix um, it might not be faster than a direct method but it will come handy in case you have a sparse matrix so what's the gauss jacobi method um, remember the system a times x equals b uh, and remember that uh, for any matrix a you can write a as the sum of matrices C plus D where D is a diagonal matrix for example 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 is obviously equal to 0 0 0 2 3 6 4 7 8 plus 1 5 9 and zeros here so this this holds for any matrix for any symmetric matrix so simply substitute a by C plus or D plus C so you will have D plus C times X equals B this is equivalent to 
dc, now dx, plus cx equals b. Then sub, uh, subtract cx, and you will get this line here, dx equals b minus cx. And now multiply by the inverse of d. So here times uh, d inverted, coming from the left. And then you will have x equal to minus d inverted cx plus d inverted b and this is the same as here and just now assume that you will use the previous vector x on the right hand side to get the next vector x on the left hand side and this is the gaussian kubi method very simple the idea is very simple um, you can then prove that it converges in some cases and this iteration sequence convergences that's a typo converges in case the spectral radius of the matrix minus d inverted times c is smaller than one that's the hard part to prove that this iteration sequence converges to the true solution x and you can show that it converges if the spectral radius of the matrix minus uh, d inverted times c is smaller than 1. We don't need to know why, we don't need the proof, but we can simply check for that uh, in MATLAB. So let's do this. This is uh, a little bit more complex function. We define the function Jacobi, Jacobi with inputs a, b, x0, that's our starting vector, eps and max iter, uh, and we will get a result x and i. Now what's the basic idea? We need the matrix A, we need the vector B, we need a starting vector for x, and we want to uh, provide the function with the maximum number of iterations it should go through before break. And we will supply the function with an epsilon, that is, if xn and xn plus 1 only differ by a small amount epsilon, we will also stop the iteration. And the function then goes on by taking the diagonal matrix of A, so that's dA, we could also have called it d, in this case we just call it dA, C is A minus the diagonal, oh no, DA is the diagonal, and by taking diag of DA, we are creating a diagonal matrix. So C is equal to A minus a diagonal matrix with D, the diagonal of A. D inf is the inverse of D. And the very nice thing is we need the inverse of D, but the inverse of a diagonal matrix is what? If this is a diagonal matrix, you will know that this is A, then A inverted is equal to 1 over 1, 1 half, 1 third. So this is very simple. So the inverse of D is a diagonal matrix with all the diagonal entries inverted. B is just minus D inverted times C. B1 is the inverse of D times B. We initialize old X, this vector, by X0, and then we start the iteration sequence. In every iteration I, we take X, equal to b times old x plus b1. Then if the norm between the two vectors, x and old x, if this norm, if, if, if the vector x has changed too little, if it's smaller than epsilon times the norm of old x, break and end, otherwise we'll set old x equal to x and start over again. 
this is the way how to um, program this iteration sequence. And we are only doing it for a maximum number of iterations. So we can set the maximum number of iterations, say, to 10,000. So if we haven't, if the iteration sequence hasn't converged after 10,000 iterations, we'll just stop. And we'll say, okay, it's enough, it will not converge. And here are two examples, A1 and A2, B. And in lines four and five, we are calculating exact one and exact two as the presumably exact solutions to these two systems of linear equations. Presumably because we are taking Gaussian elimination to calculate x1 and x2. Problem is, even in MATLAB, even with Gaussian elimination, you should know that even Gaussian elimination will include a rounding error. So I'm putting the exact, inexact solution in parentheses. Okay, and then we use the Gauss-Jacobi method uh, and x1 and x2 will be the solutions um, using this here. And we take a maximum number of 10,000 iterations and we want the solution, the change in the vector to be smaller than a factor of uh, 0 0.00000001. So that's, that's the, the, um, the second way the iteration sequence might stop. Now, as you can see, both all of these matrices and vectors appear harmless. If you were given enough time, you could solve for this on a sheet of paper. You could use Gaussian elimination. It's a four times four dimensional matrix. So that could be done in, I would assume, less than 10, 15 minutes on a sheet of paper. You know, that's even in high school. Now let's see what the Gauss-Jacobi method achieves. Uh, in the first case, you will get this vector here. And as you can see, 0 0.5556 and the exact solution by Gaussian elimination would be 0 0.5556. And actually, with four decimal points here, the result is the same as with Gaussian elimination. Second matrix. Again, yeah, instead of a 3, you have a 2. Instead of a 5, you have a 3.5. So the matrix appears to be almost the same and quite harmless. But... As you can see, x2 suddenly produces results, I would guess in the gazillions, uh, or, uh, in German, in a, in, a, in a Donald Duck uh, comic, we would say fantastilliarden, uh, 10, 10 to the 27th power, uh, that's, that's a huge number, and quite, quite of the minus 42, for example, for the first entry. The reason is, as you can see, with the first matrix, it only took us 41 iterations to get almost exactly the same result as Gaussian elimination, so the true result. And in the second case, we used up all of the 10,000 iterations. Now, you can imagine why this is the case. Obviously, these two examples were um, calibrated to show you uh, what you need to check for the convergence of the Gauss-Jacobi method. You need to look at the, again, the spectral radius of this matrix minus inverse of D times C. And no big surprise here, if you check this, you can see uh, you take D1, D2, C1, and C2, and then the spectral radius was what? The maximal absolute um, eigenvalue of the matrix, and this is what is done here, max absolute eigenvalue of minus inverse of D1 times C1 and D2 times C2, and here you will get a spectral radius of 0 0.65, so the convergence requirement is fulfilled. This is why we only need 41 iterations to get the result that was true, and in this case the convergence condition, the spectral radius, is just slightly higher than 1. 
and immediately the algorithm fails. It will not give you any result. At least not the true result or any sensible result. Yeah. So this is a very simple um, iterative uh, method to calculate the result and the solution for a system of linear equations. Okay. Now, um, let's start with the third chapter, uh, CAPM and optimization. Um, if you remember uh, what I told you in the first lecture, um, I told you that um, computational finance as an intersection of finance and, uh, and mathematics and optimization is often about option pricing and also portfolio optimization because these are the two immediate fields where you need strong mathematical algorithms to get uh, practical results. And we'll, in, this, in this third chapter, we'll talk about portfolio optimization, portfolio theory, the capital asset pricing model, which is closely related and based on portfolio theory and then on optimization algorithms. I'll start with very basic findings and very basic theory, um, that is Markowitz portfolio theory. Uh, a quick uh, quick Paul, who has already taken an investment class with Professor Schumacher, or who has already seen portfolio theory. Okay, so most of you are uh, probably, um, most of you probably know Portfolio theory by Markowitz. So this will be a repetition, but that's okay. Um, the problem with portfolio theory is it produces nice results, but these results are quite difficult to use in practice. Uh, we'll get some basic results uh, from this theoretical discussion here, and we'll later see uh, how. Uh, these methods and how these results uh, do when taken to real data. Yeah. We'll have an uh, almost uh, 30, 40 pay, uh, slides long uh, real practical example for portfolio optimization and you will see many of the practical problems associated with portfolio market, uh, Markowitz portfolio theory um, quite, um, quite openly when, when you look at these results. So we'll start with portfolio theory and portfolio optimization, then turn to capital asset pricing model, and then later on discuss in more detail some algorithms of convex optimization. Convex optimization um, sounds like uh, rocket science math stuff, but actually it's, these are regular and quite very basic optimization tools, um, and you will probably know some of the ideas from school. Take the first derivative, set it to zero, solve for x, and this will give you the critical points where to check for a global or local optima. Um, but um, we'll generalize this to uh, multidimensional vectors because we, we, we are looking not just at a function f of x, that would be very simple, but we are looking at functions that have a vector of x, portfolio weights, and this makes it a little bit harder um, to do the optimization. Okay. You can look this up in the Investment and Risiko Management textbook by Albrecht Maurer. Um, it's the same notation as in the textbook, um, and we'll um, let me just check that. Yeah, we've already talked about portfolio theory, um, but um, we want to take this a little bit further. You've already seen portfolios. You've already seen the efficient edge or the efficient frontier of uh, the set of all portfolios. The question now is which portfolio to select, and the starting point now is that portfolio selection is something that is specific to a given investor. If you are more risk averse, if you're more risk friendly, every investor will choose a different portfolio. This makes it very difficult 
for us to find general results on which portfolios and which assets to choose. What you can do is you can use a preference function, sometimes more regularly it's called a utility function. And this utility function, this preference function, will depend on, in the setting of this theory, it will depend on two, um, two variables and one parameter. It will depend on um, the return on the portfolio or an asset and the asset's volatility. And a simple example is this, the preference function or the utility of R is equal to the mean return minus a parameter A that is larger than zero times the volatility. And A in this case can be interpreted as a risk aversion parameter. The higher A is, the more you will subtract from the mean return based on the volatility, so risk is uh, the portfolio and the utility is punished harder uh, for higher risk. And then the individual optimal investment program is simply given by the solution to this maximization of the preference function with respect to the vector x, x1, x2, x3, and so on, under the condition that this is an admissible portfolio. So the combination of mu and sigma should be in the set of admissible portfolios. Okay. Now, in this example, let's take two securities and we'll take a portfolio. We'll have a portfolio weight X, and then we know that the mean return is given by mu2 plus mu1 minus mu2 times X, and this here is the portfolio volatility times the risk aversion parameter A, and very simply, the optimal portfolio um, is given by X, star that maximizes the utility of this portfolio. So you take the first derivative of V with respect to X. Uh, this is given here. You set the first derivative to zero. You solve for X and you can see that X equals 2A times sigma 1 squared plus sigma 2 squared minus 2 times the covariance of 1 and 2. You can see if you are infinitely risk averse, so if A goes to infinity, that would be an investor that is extremely risk averse. You will get the minimum variance portfolio. Well, this is very simple. Now, again, remember that um, the optimal portfolio should be included in the set of admissible portfolios. This seems a little bit theoretical because if you have a number of assets, any portfolio, any combination of X1 and X2 or of these two assets should be admissible. However, in practice, um, it might be that some combinations are not allowed. It might be that you are not allowed uh, that short selling is forbidden. And in this case, not all the, not all um, potential and all possible portfolios are admissible. Um, and also, in some cases, you're not interested in uh, an optimization of a portfolio with respect to a preference function that only includes the mean and the volatility of the portfolio. But sometimes you're also interested in optimization relative to a benchmark. You want to maximize the excess return over a benchmark, say over the DAX 30 or the S&P 500. So this could also be done. You simply have to calculate the excess return compared to the benchmark and maybe the excess volatility or just the volatility of the portfolio. And again, you will get a set of X1 to Xn that gives you the portfolio weights of this portfolio. Now. The optimization relative to a benchmark could look like this. You maximize the excess return, the return of the portfolio minus the mean return of the benchmark. And it could also be that you are setting the variance or the volatility of this portfolio equal to the volatility of the benchmark. So you want to beat the DAX or the S&P 500, but you want to have exactly the same volatility, the same amount of risk 
as the benchmark. And you can also assume or require that all the portfolio weights um, add up to one. And then these are the portfolio weights of the M securities in the benchmark, for example, in the DAX 30. But these are fixed and predetermined, so you, they will be dealt with as constants in the optimization. Now, another way to do optimization is um, to control the overall portfolio's risk and to assume that you require a minimum um, return, a minimum mean return. Then the minimum mean return or the fixed mean return enters uh, your conditions on which you optimize uh, and will be dealt with as a constraint on the optimization. And you don't have a maximization problem, but you have a minimization problem and you try to minimize over overall risk. And this is an example of a safety first approach. And you can do this by taking, for example, the shortfall probability. The shortfall probability, here abbreviated SW, is just the probability that your return is smaller or equal than a given number Q alpha. And this obviously is a quantile. So you take a quantile Q alpha and you require that the probability that you have a return that is smaller than this quantile is bounded. In other words, you could, for example, require that the probability of an extreme loss is smaller than 1%. This would be a shortfall constraint. And this is closely related to concepts like value of risk. Uh, you might remember this from the risk management class. Um, and if you were to take a normal distribution, a standard normal distribution, um, you have Z alpha, um, it's equal to minus Z1 minus alpha uh, for the standard normal um, distribution. And if you were to assume that your returns are normally distributed, you know that it will be um, determined by two parameters, mu and sigma, and X alpha will be the quantile, and this would mean that Q alpha is supposed to be smaller or equal than X alpha. And if you rearrange this uh, by using the parameters of the standard normal distribution, you will get mu larger than Q alpha plus uh, the one minus alpha quantile of the standard um, normal distribution times the volatility sigma. And these are three examples of what would happen if you were to require different shortfall probabilities or different minimum mean returns. For example, if you require 6% and you want to bound your shortfall probability to a certain extent, then you would get these different bounds on your set of admissible portfolios. Um, and this is the same just with three minimum required mean returns and a confidence level of 80%. So what does this mean? Remember that you have a minimum variance portfolio and something that looks like this. Actually, I should do this. This is the MVP. And you have the set of efficient portfolios here. Now, you know that in theory, any combination, almost any combination of mu and sigma is possible if you were only given enough assets. Now, you started, or we started with something like this, and we remember that, okay, these portfolios don't make sense because they are inefficient. So we can leave these out. And basically, Portfolio optimization is what? It's going down the edge of the efficient portfolios and finding a portfolio that is optimal for a given investor based on its preference function that fulfills all constraints. And if I were to say I'm requiring a minimum mean return 
of, say, 10%. Then 10% would be here, 0 0.1, and this would simply mean that one constraint looks like this. Okay. Have you ever done um, a linear program? Or have you ever solved a linear program in your math, math class? Probably not. Um, it's the same idea, or not really the same idea, but it's the same principle in linear optimization with linear constraints. This here is it's a line. It's a linear function. It's a linear equation. that It tells you y is equal to 0 0.1. It's a linear equation. But the constraint is not an equation. It's an inequation. We are requiring y, and let's use mu, we are requiring mu to be larger than 0 0.1. And what is an inequation? It's not a line, but what is it? What is an inequation graphically? Is everything, in this case, everything above the line? Any point here, let's take for example this, this point here, does it fulfill the inequation? Well, this here is mu equal to, let's say, 0 0.25. Yes, inequation is fulfilled. So the, the, the set of points that are related, that are associated with this inequation, are is the space above the line. It's not the line as in a linear equation, but as this is a linear inequation, it's every point above here. So in, what you usually do is, you mark this by inserting an arrow here, meaning this is everything above the line. So what happens now in optimization? You know that any portfolio here is admissible, it's an efficient portfolio, but it does not fulfill the constraint given by a mu larger than 0 0.1, that you are requiring a minimum return of at least 10%. So suddenly, your optimization is only concerned with these portfolios. And then portfolio optimization is what? It's taking the efficient edge, inserting all those somehow um, justified inequations, however they might look like, and then at the end seeing, okay, let's take green. color, so on and so on, and if these are all those inequations, if these are all the constraints you need to fulfill, you can see that only the portfolios in this green area, only those are the portfolios that still fulfill all the requirements. Yeah? And this is how, for example, if you were to include a short for probability constraint on your portfolio optimization, this would look like this. Yeah? And you can see it gets harder and harder to fulfill these requirements. And here the same with mu, mu, and mu here. So, And this is what you need to deal with. And this is what you need to optimize. Next, we'll deal with the case of several periods, and we are demanding that the, uh, the probability that the average return over, M uh, no, over T periods is larger than M, at least 
with probability one minus epsilon. So we could, for example, uh, demand that the probability of an average return of at least 5% is larger than 95%. So this would be an example for this constraint here. Average returns over time should be higher than the minimum return M with probability 1 minus epsilon. So if we assume that the returns are normally distributed, again, with mu plus uh, Z quantile at 1 minus epsilon times sigma over uh, square root of uh, capital T for a quantile, equivalently, we get mu is larger than M plus the Z quantile times sigma divided by the square root of t. Very simple to see this. Why? Well, if r is normally distributed, then the sum of t r's is normally distributed. Then the probability is also uh, the probability taken from a normal distribution. And this is how you will get this result. So again, on the next slide, you can see that the restriction on the probability is more easily fulfilled as time goes by. Why is that? Very simple. If you require a minimum return of 5% next year, this is harder to get than if you require the minimum return over the next 10 years to be at least 5%. Because you will have more time in which an even higher return can cancel out lower returns before. If you only have one chance to get about 5%, it's harder than if you have 10 years time. So again, you will have a harder and more difficult time to fulfill this requirement, this constraint on your optimization. Yeah? Okay. Finally, uh, one could require the return to be higher than a certain minimum in every period, saying, I want 5% minimum next year, in two years, in three years, in T years, with at least 95% probability. And if we were to assume an unrealistic, unrealistically, that the returns are IID, normally distributed, uh, or just IID, um, we have that. This is the probability of R1 larger than M1, if we are setting all the minimum returns constant and equal to M, this will mean that what is the probability to have 5% next year and 5% in two years and 5% in three years and so on. And this is just the probability of rolling a dice. Yeah? What's the probability of rolling a six this time, next time, in two throws, in three throws, etc. It's just probability times probability times probability. So you get the product of the individual probability and that's just this here. This, the probability is the same in every round so it's the teeth power of the single individual probability to have 5% minimum return or M% percent next year. And for this constraint we simply have the probability of R is larger than M is larger or equal than the teeth square root of 1 minus epsilon. That's also quite simple. And as the term, the square root is a quantity that increases with t. This is a tightening of the constraint on the minimum required return. And now in the next step, we want to include these shortfall restrictions in the portfolio optimization. So first, we transfer the safety first approach to the optimization of portfolios. We maximize the mean return with respect to or under the condition that the probability that return is smaller or equal than M is smaller or equal than epsilon. So this is the shortfall restriction. And again, we forbid short selling and we can only invest what we have. So the portfolio weight should add up to one. They should sum up to one and they should be non-negative. Now, if we assume a certain statistical distribution for the returns, the first constraint can be transferred into a quasi-deterministic linear inequation so that the optimization is relatively easy. What you will see is that this shortfall constraints uh, will simply cut 
through the set of admissible portfolios, just as I've shown you here. Yeah? So you will cut down the set of portfolios to this area. And this is actually not too difficult to do in optimization. Um, you can also include additional constraints, um, for example, for specific days. In practice, you will get, you will often see constraints that certain asset classes should not have weights larger than, say, 10%, 15%. Short selling will regularly be um, excluded, um, and some kind of, uh, some types of financial institutions will also have to abide by uh, legal requirements. Uh, as you might know, insurance companies are not allowed to fully invest uh, in all asset classes, um, and this should also be included in your portfolio optimization. So in the end, you will see something like this. You will have the efficient edge, starting at the minimum variance portfolio, and then you will look for an efficient and optimal portfolio in this area here that is admissible under all the different constraints on your optimization. Okay. Now, if I only include this uh, uh, for completion here, uh, um, this is uh, a stylized uh, graph of the process of portfolio optimization. You will use research data on your time series, on your assets uh, as input. You will have an optimizer, and the result will be what? It will be the optimal portfolio weights and the optimal mean and volatility of your portfolio or any other type of metric you will use. For an optimal portfolio, you can obviously also calculate different metrics like a value of risk, expect, expected shortfall, and so on. Now, what are some practical problems of Markowitz portfolio optimization, as shown here? Uh, in, in essence, you will also see this later on in the uh, real-life example. The main problem is that it's completely... Um, how should I put it? Um, it's a pure mathematical exercise. And in its most basic form, you will have no short selling restriction. And two problems are quite well known. The first problem is that uh, the optimal portfolio might look like this. You have $1,000, take up 1 million, uh, short sell uh, a couple of thousand stocks of A, then you will have a million or two million euros and invest all of this money in a couple of thousand stocks of stock B. So you will have extreme portfolio weights with sometimes extreme amounts of short selling. And in practice, you will never do this. You will never have such a large short position as a portfolio manager. It might be that you will get a tiny better portfolio then without short selling, but in its most purest form, this purely mathematical type of portfolio optimization will put a lot of effort and will put a lot of money uh, on short selling some assets and going long in some other assets. That's one of the major problems, practical problems. The second major problem is that the portfolio weights sometimes are extremely sensitive. Meaning that if your parameters change just a little bit, and parameters with parameters I mean mu and sigma. So if the mean return, if the volatility of an exit of a stock changes just a little bit, it might be that your portfolio weights, which might look like this, they will change dramatically. And this would mean that you need to sell off your position A and go long in position B. And this, in the portfolio theory without transaction costs, has no problem attached to it. But in real life, you cannot sell off all your portfolio assets the next day and again the following day and so on. So you will only allow for slight changes to your portfolio weights from round to round. Uh, and if you include transaction costs, 
this changes a lot. So efficiency issues, transaction costs need to be uh, considered here in order to make this work. Okay. Capital asset pricing model. Um, portfolio theory by Markowitz is regularly only used for asset allocation, meaning that you do not optimize the individual assets, but you apt, uh, optimize over the asset allocation. Uh, for example, between stocks and bonds and uh, real, real estate investment funds, etc. And for asset classes, portfolio weights will not change too much. So you can use portfolio optimization based on Markowitz portfolio theory for asset allocation. But it, when it comes to investing in the individual asset classes, you will use what we refer to as a factor model. Now, at the security level, factor models are used. The most basic form of a factor model is the capital asset pricing model. And there have been a huge number, an abundance of um, generalizations and extensions of the CAPM. Uh, for example, Pharma French, Pharma French Carhart. Um, this is all part of what is called in finance asset pricing. Um, if, if, you've, if you've thought about what subfields are there in finance, you will find corporate finance, banking, option pricing, asset pricing. Uh, and asset pricing is a huge subfield in finance. And it starts with a very simple idea, how should the price of an asset look like in an arbitrage-free efficient market? You will start with the basic idea that you will have an investment, it will pay out $1 in the future, and what should the price of this investment be today? There, there is one very excellent book on asset pricing. And it will also show you how asset pricing uh, and very simple ideas about pricing assets, um, how, about the, how these ideas are related to the factor models. That's the uh, asset pricing book by Cochrane. Uh, John Cochrane, formerly from the University of Chicago. He also has a lot of YouTube videos uh, uploaded uh, and a whole course, I think, uh, on YouTube explaining as the fundamentals of asset pricing uh, and how this is related to factor models. In the end, it's all about expected returns. Uh, and obviously, in an efficient market, you can show theoretically how asset prices should look like. And what the investor, how, what the portfolio manager will do is to match the price or to find, to single out those investments that are currently underpriced, that are currently cheap, and for which you will expect prices to increase. So this is what asset pricing is all about, to identify nice investment opportunities, to, de uh, to derive the theoretical price, the fair price of an asset. And if you know, a simple example, if you know this, this house here is worth a million, and it currently sells for 800,000, you, can, you should buy it. You will make a profit out of it. If you know that this uh, house is only worth one million, one moment. If you know this house is only worth one million, it currently sells at two million. It's heavily overpriced and it's not a good investment opportunity. So this is the basic idea in asset pricing to find theoretical prices. And if you can observe market prices, you can compare theoretical and market so we need to come up with a fair arbitrage-free price of any individual security uh, in a factor model. And a factor model or a market model in its simplest form is given by this equation here, the return, of an in, the return on an individual asset, I, is given by alpha plus beta I times the return on a market index on some kind of factor, plus a pricing error, epsilon i. Okay, what are the assumptions in the capital asset pricing model? The assumptions are 
just like in a very simple uh, ordinary least squares uh, framework, um, the mean of the pricing errors is supposed to be zero. Um, the pricing errors are um, the, uh, are given by the variance or the variance of the pricing errors is given by sigma i squared, and the pricing errors are uncorrelated with the returns. Now, just like in an OLS framework, it follows that under these assumptions, the covariance between the return and the factor is given by bi times the variance of the factor, or the beta is given by the covariance between the individual return and the market factor return divided by the market factor's variance. And what you are doing in the capital asset pricing model is, as the factor, as the only single factor you're using to explain the uh, individual assets return, you're taking the market index portfolio. And that's the market portfolio itself. So you're taking all the assets in a market, you construct the market portfolio, and that's your only factor. B is called the better factor. It's called the investments better relative to the chosen market portfolio. And you can see, and this is now important, the expected return on the investment. And this means the return in the future is given by the alpha factor plus the beta factor times the expected return on the factor, which in this case is the market portfolio. So what does this mean? <laughs> Any idea? Does anyone remember what the alpha and the beta factors tell you? Here you can see what is important. The alpha factor, yeah? Yeah, the alpha factor is not the uh, um, explained return of, of the, uh, the assets by the market. Yeah, and this means? Uh, this would be a looking for. Yeah, exactly. You're looking, as an investor, you're looking for alpha factor. That cannot be explained by the factor that in this model should explain all the returns. And you can see also here, alpha i is the, the excess mean return over the mean return on the factor. So this is the alpha factor, and as an investor factor, you're looking for alpha. Yeah? Actually, there are a couple of papers that include this statement, looking for alpha. Yeah? In addition, you can see that the volatility of the market index portfolio return is given by this quantity and you can see that the volatilities of the individual investments and the volatility of the market index just in part and if we break, break down the individual volatility we have what with this part and this part and that's one of the famous results also in the capital asset pricing model that an individual investment's risk can be divided into a systematic part and an unsystematic part. Systematic meaning that an investment or the return on an investment will co-vary with the market return. And you cannot change this. If the market goes up or down, your return on stock Daimler or the stock of BMW it will also be affected. And this is systematic risk. You cannot change this. But you can try to take an investment that has a certain portfolio, uh, no, that has a certain uh, correlation with the market return, and then you can eliminate, you can fully eliminate the unsystematic part of risk. And this is if rho equal to 1 here. Then you have 1 minus 1 and this will vanish. So this is systematic and unsystematic risk. You've seen this here. If you take the better factor, um, the better factor can be expressed by the systematic risk 
of investment I divided by market risk. Um, and this can be used now to derive the capital asset pricing model. You can also see that all the assumptions, all the notation is exactly the same as in an ordinary least squares linear regression analysis. And this is no coincidence because you will do what? You will draw a graph, you will have your individual assets here and you will try to estimate a linear regression and this is actually shown here return on the market portfolio, return on the security, um, and this here will give you your alpha, and the slope of the regression equation is your beta factor. So this is very, very, very simple, and I think well known. This is a very simple factor model. You can extend this in numerous ways. Pharma French Oh, does not include, does not only include a market factor. Uh, does anyone know what um, what Pharma French and Pharma French Cars include? Two and three additional factors. So it's small minus big. Yeah. Sure. And? I think cars was in addition to momentum. Yeah, momentum. Small minus big and high minus low. What you do is you um, artificially, more or less, construct so-called arbitrage portfolios. Arbitrage portfolios are, simply put, a way to invest in a certain property of a company without taking any money um, in your hand. And what you do is you short sell uh, those stocks for example, that are very low in a certain property. And you use this money from short selling to buy those stocks that have very, very high values in the certain property. So for example, I could, I could try to build a, an arbitrage portfolio based on firm age. I will short sell stocks of companies that have only been around like one year and I will use this money from short sales to buy those stocks of companies that are at least 100 years old. And I do this in a fashion so that the price of this portfolio is zero, so it will be a zero cost strategy. However, if age has anything to do with return, this portfolio will yield heavily and heavy, quite strong returns and high returns if age is a factor in driving that drives stock returns. Mm -hmm. You get this idea of an arbitrage portfolio? You, you could say, for example, if I were to tell you high tech, yeah, high tech is the driving factor between expected returns. Then it would just do, say, okay, let's buy up stocks or high tech companies. Let's buy Google, Amazon, Microsoft. But this would cost you money because you need to buy these stocks. How would you finance this? Well, you would finance this strategy by short selling stocks that are the quite opposite of high tech. And this is an arbitrage portfolio. And this is how small minus big, high minus low, and momentum factors are constructed in the Pharma French or Pharma French Carhart models. And this is what asset pricing studies usually do. They try to identify a new factor that might be driving stock returns and then testing whether you will get a high alpha out of this. This is asset pricing. These are factor models. Now what we will do next time is we haven't yet included the risk-free investment. And then we'll have a factor model, we'll have the market portfolio, and we'll have risk-free investment, and this will yield the so-called two funds theorem and the Tobin separation. But we'll talk about this next week. Do you have any questions? Okay, so thank you for your attention and see you next week.